what year are we talking about now, sir, and how old are you? I am, um, it was late uh, 30s, let's say that it was 1940, and I was born in 1921. Today, that means just the other day, I became, it was my 84th birthday. So I was at that point, like I say, two years behind. Therefore, I must have been about 18, maybe 19. When I was laid up, he came and he says, go to this place here and uh, apply for a job. He's a Caucasian guy now. So I went to this place, he called it American Screw Machine. Lived in just on the outskirts of LA and they took my social security number, just like that, hired me. They didn't ask for a reference, anything, no nothing. That's when I got the work and it turned out to be a defense plant. They just didn't hire Japanese in those days. We were lucky to get it. Why? Do you happen to know why, sir? As I worked there, there was another Japanese guy working in another section of only one. He was working in that time working on an automatic lathe. Mm -hmm. He is probably the one because they probably hired him. So I specifically think that this friend of mine was telling me that he was looking for a specific Japanese Nisei boy. That's the impression I got later on. I went to the work then and I started doing just any kind of work and drill press, anything. And then the war came. I witnessed the American shooting at an enemy plane over our factory. There was an enemy airplane that came? There was an illusion of it. It was a big write-off. And I was directly beneath it watching the fall wires because by then I was working on it late at night. But what happened was that as a opening came and then when the war came, they were more anxious than ever. And so they asked me if I would be willing to learn to run the engine lathe. I said, sure, no problem, just teach me. So I was on a day shift on a certain day. And I was just taking instruction, taking out the mail. And I noticed that they were watching me like what I was doing. And they would check all my parts that I was producing. And next thing I know, they gave me a raise. What had happened was that on the same engine lathe, there was a white guy that was working there a long time, was working the night shift. The night shift worked nine hours a day, I worked eight hours, and was out producing the night shift by something like 30%. I didn't, had no idea. So by the time the war came, and not only that, he asked if I would be interested in working nights, and I told him I would rather stay in the day, but anyway, they kept me. 
<laughs> when the war came, I was picked up by the whether it was an FBI agent, Secret Service or not, passing as an FBI agent, came over to the house, introduced himself, and I wasn't too surprised, knowing the kind of work I was doing. So he and I, he said, he gave me my life history. They had been talking to the neighbors all the way around, our neighbors. And in the subject of, actually this is touching on dual citizenship, but anyway, this is, tell me, it says there was a, you were instructed to go to the Japanese Embassy or whatever they call it at that time to register as a son. And I realized what had happened at that time when they when I was told to register at that it it turns out that my brother had been registered with the Japanese consulate. And at a certain age, my father took his name off and put my name in. So the agent asked me if I would show him where the place was. So I told him, I took him there. And they went to the office and everything. He had to be a Issei man. I don't know where he came from. And he started to lecture me then. But what I was doing was terrible and all that. So what are you talking about? I'm not a Japanese, I'm an American. He didn't say anything more. I didn't I never talk to my brother or my father about it or anything. But that's how I happened to reason that, that I was, when I went and registered, when I realized that, I was very upset with my father. And I was steaming about it, and then that's when the, the neighbors heard about it. So they knew what had happened. But. They kept me on, as a matter of fact, they gave me several raises until I was, I started at about $24 a week. By the time they let me go, I'm assuming the government told them to get rid of me. I was making $54 a week. That was more money than I ever made in my life. I had a sister back east, Marge, the one I was just told her, and I, I told her about it. She says, save your money, you'll never did that make that kind of money in the rest of your life. Then the evacuation came. But anyway, just before, less than a month before the evacuation, I got the order that they had to lay me out. They didn't say I was fired. They just said to let me go. And I assumed that there was a government because this company, they were happy, so happy they asked me to get another Nisei. That's when I got my brother in there. He was working with me too. But the evacuation came, shipped us out to Arizona, not or, or, uh, Wyoming. Actually, no, I, I take it back. We went to the assembly center in Pomona. That's where you went. They took away all your cameras. 
any guns, any knives, kitchen utensils maybe. And you were told to go out there in the field and pick up this bag and fill up full of straw that was down there, take it to your crib, so to speak, in, in Pomona. It's Pomona Fairground. And then they're ready to send us to Heart Mountain to open up and, and uh, open up uh, Heart Mountain. And I volunteered to go with them. We were the first group to go there. So they put on a two-two train that looked like it was about as old as I don't know. Two-two train with the smoke coming pouring out of there and, and ashes all over. And we stayed in this with the shades drawn, and we, if you want to go to the toilet, you go over there and you do your business, you flush it, and the bottom opens up and you can see the rail ties going back. Those rail ties, I never forgot it. Uh, Mr. Hashimoto, before we continue on with the internal next week, a couple questions um, about events that happened before that. Uh, would you briefly describe your your high school? Where did you go to high school? What was it like? Do um, you have any interaction with, with uh, different ethnic groups? Uh, things like that. So what, what high school did you go to? I went to the Monroe Arcadia Duarte High School. M A D. Monrovia was where it was uh, located. Arcadia was my town. Duarte was town, another town surrounding. And that was in Monrovia. I don't recall any real. Hmm. What would you call it? What would you call uh, mistreatment or anything like that? I find I kind of found it in in primary school, but very little of it. But in high school, I didn't. I was treated as normally as possible. I made. Uh, along with the teachers other than the fact that one teacher put me aside and said see you look like a brother kid but your brother your brother Bill really tried and she said that because I, my grades weren't the best in the world but I did have teachers even from grade school that uh, I got along well with one we had one that was a male, was a little different, but I didn't pay much attention to that. So I can't really say that I felt that any much of a dis discrimination. What did you do in high school besides just be a student? Were you in any extracurricular activities, any clubs? No. I Why was, was that, sir? I was busy working before and after school. At the farm? At your farm? Your parents' On farm? the brood ranch, as well as my farm. So you worked at both places. Mm -hmm. And what was your, so describe a, a typical day for you. When, when, what time did you get up? Uh, what did you do? Went to, and then you went to school, and then you, you, you went to work somewhere. Would you describe that, please? Yes, I would. I was always a work early riser. I was up at least at five, and five in the morning, mm -hmm. or even earlier, depending on when there was carrots to pick or the fruit and vegetables to be harvested. Then both my sister Marge and I 
maybe three or four o'clock in the morning, barely light enough to do, pick the fall, the vegetables, tie them up, take them to a shed we had, hose it down, then I'd go to my ranch, brood ranch where the horses were, take the horses out, feed the water, give them oats and some hay, and that was it. Then I'd go to school. And after school, I'd come home, go directly to the brood ranch. I would clean, I would clean up the stalls, take all the manure out, I would spread the straws that I had sh shift over to the side to let it let it dry during the day. I'd just spread the straw if I needed more straws. I put straws out there. Then I put the oats and everything into where they they would eat it. The hay I would feed them in, in the morning. Then I would lead them all back into the barn and lock them up for the night. Make sure they was. They got the water before I did that. Then I go home to take the vegetables and everything. Now at this time, my brother was working for managing a fruit stand. He just gave us instructions of what to do and he had taken over from my dad. My dad did the planning and, and uh, growing of it. And uh, we would harvest it, get it all prepared, take it to the market. And after I got through with my horses, I would get my pickup truck, put the fruits on, I mean the vegetables on it, take my heart, my dog, and I'd take to the market, Central Market in LA. Um, and w what what time of the day was that when you went to the market in downtown LA? It was anywhere around five or a little after. In in the afternoon. Towards the evening, mm -hmm. yeah, late uh, afternoon. Sometime it's later. And how long did it take you to drive from your place to to the LA? Area? I'm sorry. To the market. Yes. I would say between half hour to forty five minutes, closer to forty five minutes or more, depending on the traffic. And what was the main road that you took to get there? The name of the road. I remember Atlantic, I remember Rosemead Boulevard, uh, you know, things like that. And and it was towards, let's see, it's hard to visualize it now, but I know these intersections at that time. And then coming back, I would come back, I would take First Street all the way back towards in our area. Yeah, and I'd uh, take a shower, whatever, go to bed, get up early, whatever we had to do. And uh, my work on the brood ranch was seven days a week. Sir, would you say that the way you described your typical day, other than uh, at the ranch, was typical of anybody who was working on the farm then? I don't think so. Well, the farm work itself probably was a bit more routine. Maybe the harvest was a regular. The truckers came and took the produce to the market. We were too small to have a trucker come. Mm -hmm. Not in Arcadia, in San Gabriel, yes. Mm -hmm. But in Arcadia, 
It was my brother who was working outside as a manager of a fruit stand and so forth. He was the one that was bringing the money to buy the groceries and do this. All I did, I never got any allowance. Only money I ever got was going through my laundry and nickels and dimes from my brother's pants, but that wasn't quite enough. My mother used to give me a little spending money every so often, but after I was old enough, by the time I went to, was in high school, by the time by my third year in high school, towards the latter part of the third year, I had saved enough money that I went, took my older sister, went down to Figueroa Street in L.A. and bought a 1934 it was a 1932 or 34 Ford with a rumble seat. You bought it? Bought it with my own money. And uh, my sister signed as a whatever, whatever, you know. They sold it to me. And it was one of the few very handful of students who had a car. I had a buddy who used to ride around bicycles with me and he would have a brand new bicycle and I'd have bicycles that I had made, kind of made myself. And by the time I was in high school, he had a brand new car. But I had a 1934 Ford with a Roman seat. And, and so uh, what did you do with the car? Huh? I sold. Oh, I sold it to uh, a guy that worked in a in a in a, in a uh, milk farm. I used to go and go over there and buy milk. And uh, I told him, "So look, got a car. I like to uh, get rid of. I have you." He says, "Are you interested?" So, oh yeah. How much do you want? And I forgot how much it was. It wasn't very much. So I tell you, I tell you what, I'll sell you the car. I want to get paid, but I want to use it until I leave. And at that point, I'll give you the pink slip, the whole thing, and you can take over. Is that okay? That's okay. Sold it just like that. Mr. Hashimoto, I want to ask you about the rest of the the, the Japanese um, population around where you were living. Were there ever occasions where groups of people got together to celebrate a particular festival or a Japanese holiday or a religious? Uh, oh yes. And would you describe where did it happen? And would you? Describe, describe. Those that I attended, I didn't attend too many of them, but I did attend a few because I was always working, as I say. But usually it was these, they call it the Kenjinkai, the prefectural uh, association or something. They would, Kumamoto King would have uh, picnics like in Lincoln Park, which is they used to call the Luna Zoo in those days. And I remember going there. The reason I I remember there is that one of the boys I met there was killed during that thing, and I was there. The way it happened that there was a statue here, and we were all playing around with it, and uh, he was climbing on it or something, and the thing, the statue toppled over on him, and he was a Nisei guy, kid. And I heard that he was injured and he died. But the only thing that I remember is the fact that it could very well have been me, because I was doing the same thing that he was doing. That's the only reason I remember him. But I remember the zoo and the the, the food they had, and even 
things to do there, but I remember that as, as some of the outings. But there were others where they had uh, judo and sumo and, and games. And uh, I used to attend to few of them, not too many. Always because I had other things to do. What about religious festivals like uh, Obon? The what? Obon. Did you ever? Later on, yes. And where was that answer? Uh, they used to have some in Arcade, uh, El Monte, but it was mostly in L.A. As a matter of fact, there's, I, have, I wasn't too interested in that, but my sister, that was two years older than I, she, I have pictures of her in kimono and her girlfriend, and they would see it, but uh, the more, most I ever saw them was during the Nisei week or or a festival, and they did have festivals, and they remember faintly that there was some oibo dancing, but I don't remember too much of it because I wasn't interested in it. Really. What about then, uh, Christmas when you were growing up, if, if, if you knew this, where did uh, your parents or your neighbors, where did they get the, their food from, other than farming it themselves? Where, where did you get, uh, was there a Japanese market in the area? Uh, they, I don't think there was, uh, may have been a few, but Generally, like fish or something like that, they had people came making around selling. And uh, I only remember something like that because I was never involved in the grocery department or anything. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, later on, as I got older, we just shopped at the regular stores sometime at fruit stands, but uh, mostly we were pretty close to uh, towns or we weren't as if we were in way out in the country, in Akai and someplace. When you say town, sir, which town is that? Arcadia. And so you were able to get such things as, as Japanese rice, uh, tofu, shoyu, they must have come from other sources other than the, the locals. But I must say that they must have been some stars. Like uh, before when I lived in Arcadia, uh, in San Gabriel, I used to, my dad used to give me some money, I would pick up. Uh, at the South Cedar's store uh, where I would get a thing like bread and uh, salami or things like that, little stuff like that. Regular groceries, as I remember me having to go out and do any shopping or anything like that, I didn't do too much of that. But we did have regular stores. I don't think we, we had some Japanese stores, uh, but it's not as if I go out and buy Japanese food. So uh, you have to remember that by the time I was becoming a teenager, we didn't have a mother. We used to do our own cooking, and the kids would kind of take over. So our diet has started to change, as a matter of fact. At one point, we always had an ice box, but as uh, I made more money, I used to go out and make and 25 cents an hour. I used to make quite a piece of change. I used to buy a refrigerator out of the generosity of my heart on a time payment so that we would waste, we would save money by not wasting food. That was my object, I remember. That was one and the only thing that I bought for the house, and that was a refrigerator. And that was part of the 
later part of the 30s by then. Keep in mind that I was working not only on, on the farm or in the brood ranch or on the weekends. I was looking for jobs around the neighborhood. And uh, that's how I got my bicycle. I had worked for a Jewish lady in, in exchange for a bicycle. I got a bicycle. When you say refrigerators, sir, do you mean a refrigerator as an electric appliance or an ice box? Electrical refrigerator. Up to then, and that time was only in the last two years, three years, or maybe even a little bit longer, because I remember that Iceman would come and we'd have a hole in the floor and uh, Food was, vegetables were just not, that was my thing that I would save money by getting a refrigerator and I bought one on time. Don't tell me why, but I got it. Now, as uh, I want to ask you uh, about uh, how your family or, or you, but usually your parents, how did they receive information or news about the community or the world? And for example, was there a radio in your home when you were growing up? Oh yes. And what kind of stations, radio stations did your parents listen to? I don't recall that they ever listened to radios. We kids did. My sister and I also used to fight over it, so I know that. Do you remember if there was a Japanese language radio station at that time? I'm not. I'm not positive, but it's possible. That I don't really remember definitely that there was. I don't remember that. And what about a newspaper? Oh yes, there was some Japanese paper. Did you? Did, were they delivered to your your house? I think so. That was actually towards the latter part of the latter part of my as I as just before the war came. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you had said earlier that you didn't speak that much to your parents when you were growing up, but uh, while you were growing up, did they ever speak to you about Japan? Very little. And for you, besides speaking Japanese, uh, you must have been, your parents exposed you to certain traditions, rituals, and things like that. Uh, did they both do that, or was there one parent that actually took care of your education in, in terms of uh, traditions? You have to keep in mind that the father and I was done very close for many, many, many number of years. Uh, I think he probably did his best, but it was the mother who even made little judogis for me when I was telling her I like to do judo like my brother did, and father wouldn't let me, so it was must be her that was more of the uh, because my father and I really never really were very close until way later on and then by then it was after the war because we were separated quite a number of years during the war. Uh, and what are the things and do you recall that your mother did for you that taught you your, your, your cultural heritage? The, the Japanese culture heritage? There's uh, it's a very difficult question because our family, our parents, were not as strict or formal as I believe the other families were. That was because they 
harmony within the family, I think. That there were not that many things that we did together. We, we went to uh, outings, uh, picnics, and so forth. But I don't recall that they did, did anything special that tried to teach us things. Mm -hmm. To me, I was not interested, number one, that, which is the worst thing. Uh, my olders, elders, yes, probably. By the youngers, I don't think so. The only time I regretted not uh, being more attention getting on about the Japanese language when I volunteered to serve in the Pacific. But you and your brothers and sisters all spoke Japanese? Yes. And that was from, all of you attended Japanese language school? Yes. And you had no choice in, in, in that? Well, probably did, but I was one of the worst ones to to uh, to uh, toe the line, so to speak. And uh, I never argued against it or anything. I took it as something that I had to do, but I could have made a, a better job of learning and so forth. And which I regretted when the war came. And, and I, 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 again, I may have asked you this before, but I want to ask you your parents, did they ever speak to you or your brothers or sisters about Japan? Not very much. Now, I would also like to revisit something that you had said earlier, sir, about your father had registered you the Council General Office of Japan. Mm -hmm. What? Well, he registered your name, but do you know what that registry was? No. What it was about? Not at that time. Do, that, you, know, do you now know what that meant? Yes. Would you explain that, sir? Well, I'm assuming that the council or whatever, our parents were, whether they were required or not, evidently, if they had a son, the son was registered with the consulate, let's say. Mm -hmm. And that meant that they would be registered, whether they would be subject to draft into the military if they ever got to Japan or not, I don't know. But, like I say, when my brother Bill got to the age, I don't know what age it was, his name was taken off and my name was replaced to come up like this. I'm assuming that I did end up in Japan eventually that some of those nieces, I'm pretty sure from what I learned or from what I saw or what I assumed, that some were drafted or forced to serve in the military. Now, whether that is true or not, it's only what I presumed and what I seem to hear and because at that point everything was different of course we were the occupation mm -hmm. so uh, and some of those that boys that were there I talked to a few they casually that some were coerced to serve or whatever, or voluntarily, or if they weren't, 
there's one lady said, one gal said that if she didn't do something or other, her rash, medical or her or her rations would be cut. Her rations and her families would get the ration, but her, she would not get any rations. It appeared people tell me that. Now, I'm sure that Nisei's were treated differently in Japan. Just because they were, like in my autobiography, that they weren't offstrings of the less than desirable people in Japan. You know, very, they're very social conscious. That was, that was the alarm for